Greetings and welcome to this edition of Campus Conversations. I'm Dan Mogola from the University's Office of Communications and Public Affairs. And today I'm honored and really pleased to welcome for the very first time our relatively new UCPD chief, Yogananda Pittman, who took office last February. Chief Pittman previously, previously served as the assistant chief of the United States Capitol Police, where she had served for more than two decades. Her experience includes providing protective details for U.S. senators and visiting dignitaries, supervising hundreds of officers, and leading security efforts for P President Obama's second presidential inauguration. She served as the interim chief of the United States Capitol Police for six months in the aftermath of the events at the Capitol on January 6, 2021. Chief Pittman is a graduate of Morgan State University in Maryland, obtained her master's degree in public administration from Marist College in New York, and is a PhD candidate in public administration from Westchester University in Pennsylvania. We already have a number of excellent questions that you've sent in, in hand, but if you'd like to pose a query for Chief Pittman as we go along, just post it to our Facebook live streaming site and we'll do our very best to respond. Let's get started. Chief Pittman, thanks so much for being here today. Good afternoon, Dan, and thank you so much for, for having me. Pleasure. Um, tell us a little start of, just tell us a little about why public safety, why law enforcement? What drew you to that profession? Well, uh, I will start with, uh, Dan, I did not grow up wanting to be a police officer. I didn't watch uh, cop shows and that <laughs> blood, so to speak. But I did grow up uh, the daughter and granddaughter of public servants, civil rights activists uh, that were very adamant uh, in instilling in us as children that we had a responsibility to give back to the community and to serve. So I've always had a heart for service and I've continued that. I have a brother that's a retired uh, FBI agent. I have several members of my family that um, are retired from the armed services community. So I really have that in my blood and in my spirit. And stepping back, like in the big picture, how do you think about public safety and law enforcement? I mean, this has been at the top of the national agenda now for a number of years. Um, with, you know, everything from, you know, efforts or advocacy to defund police or to bolster police and, you know, in, you know, perceptions of increasing crime and data about increasing crime. And where do you fall out? How do you see law enforcement, public safety in general and on a college campus in particular? Well, speaking in general terms, uh, I understand the uh, country's sentiment toward law enforcement. Let me start by saying I am proud and honored uh, to wear the badge and the uniform. I'm proud to serve beside my UCPD colleagues and peers. I'm proud to serve this community. However, I also understand the challenges and the need for police reform uh, across the board, across the country. Uh, there are things that uh, law enforcement as a profession can do better. <clears throat> I think by and large, most of us serve with a compassionate heart and we are here to do the right thing for the right reason 365 days a year. We also must acknowledge and accept accountability for our actions uh, when things don't go as we train, uh, when things don't go uh, with folks leading from a place of compassion. And we have to have that transparency. We owe that to the community and the people that we serve uh, to be transparent about our actions. But I think it's more important to hold uh, officers accountable when there are inappropriate actions. We, we are um, uh, blessed with an opportunity when we're serving the public. So we must answer to the public when things don't go right. In terms of your second question, uh, what are some of the differences uh, between a campus uh, law enforcement community 
versus a municipality. Uh, there are more similarities than differences. I uh, personally came from an open campus environment serving on uh, Capitol Hill to an open, open campus environment here at Berkeley. I will also say that there are a lot of differences in terms of the type of community. Uh, by and large, the population here that we serve in are students, staff, and faculty. Um, our students are uh, a different type of population. We all, as a, just as a parent, Dan, um, as parents, we want our students to have a wonderful college experience. Uh, we know that sometimes boundaries will be tested, but we want them to be tested in a controlled environment. And so we want to grant grace in this community to make sure we're ensuring that they have uh, the safest experience possible. Chief, if I remember correctly, you have two teenage sons. Do I have that right? So uh, you're almost correct. I have one teenage son. He'll be the youngest will be 18 in about two weeks. So happy pre-birthday to him. And then I have a 23-year-old uh, senior college student who plays football uh, out in Richmond, Virginia. Got it. So how do you bring or do you bring their lived experience, your own lived experience to work every day? How does that impact or does it impact the way you think about your job and your responsibilities? Yes, it, it really does. And I'm genuinely appreciative of this question. Uh, being an African-American woman and a leader in law enforcement, being the mother of two African-American young men, sometimes their engagement with law enforcement has not always been positive. Uh, they see their mother as a role model and example of what is right with law enforcement, but it also suggests that we have work to do. Uh, my sons are a constant reminder of that. Anytime I'm engaging with the community, I really see them as my family. I look at uh, the community as that somebody's father, uh, that somebody's mother, that somebody's child. And we may be seeing them at a time when they're not at their best, but it is still our responsibility to make sure we're serving them and their needs with respect and compassion. And we have to treat them as if though, if that was our mother or our sons, how would we want someone to take care of them, uh, to serve them during their times of need? Yeah, wow. There's a lot to lot to think about there in that answer. Um, before we kind of delve deeper into Berkeley specific questions, let's change geography for a second. January 6th in the Capitol, uh, a, a dark and historic day for this country. What was that like and how do you think about it now that you've had some chance to get both geographical distance and sort of time distance away from all that happened? How do you look back on that day and the days that followed? It was a horrific day for this country. It's a day I'll never forget. I always like to start with, I want to honor and respect those who lost their lives on that day. Uh, I started serving as the interim chief on January 8th. On my first evening on the job, I lost an officer mm. uh, to suicide, Officer Howie Liebengood. I also lost Officer Brian Sicknick. And uh, everywhere I've gone around the country and around the world at this point, I never want anyone to forget what we lost. I also don't want anyone to forget the resiliency of those that serve the United States Capitol Police. Those women and men save democracy. They literally were the last line of defense between those um, insurrectionists and members of the congressional community. 
they held fast that day. Um, it wasn't pretty, it was brutal. Um, I'm always pleased to see that individuals are being held accountable for their acts of violence toward law enforcement on that day. But I also am so proud to be part of uh, the change and rerouting that ship in history and being able to turn that organization around and the amount of time that we did there uh, not only showed up on January 6th, they came back on January 7th with uh, being ready to serve. And I, I couldn't be more proud of, of all of them. So you've come literally at least a long way since then. You're here on the West Coast on the Berkeley campus, and we're glad to have you here. Um, what's it been like? What's the transition been like? What, what surprised you for either pleasantly or unpleasantly? Because there are not a lot of places like UC Berkeley. It's been a lot of uh, pleasant surprises. I am honored and privileged to serve here. Um, I don't know if I should be surprised by this, but I do feel a sense of honor and pride with the overwhelmingly welcoming responses that I've received from so many uh, along my journey uh, with the campus community. I've had a chance, Dan, now to meet with so many different groups and organizations uh, within the community. And by and large, they are welcoming of a police presence. Uh, I had heard things um, about the Berkeley campus, about the surrounding community and its um, attitude, so to speak, towards law enforcement. I do understand the concerns. I, I know that sometimes a uniform presence uh, can be a trigger for some on this community. So I am working hard every day along with my colleagues to make sure that we're collaborating with the community so that we can change that narrative by our actions and by our words to say that we don't want to elicit a negative response. We really want to be called upon to serve when there's a need uh, for safety and security within this community. And, and to be blunt, have you found a receptive audience for that orientation of the community and relationship and to rebuilding or to building a positive relationship with the community? Have you found any resistance within the department? Not at all. The community has really welcomed us with open arms. I've spoke to um, community members down at Albany Village. I've spoken with the College of Engineering. I'm scheduled to speak with the uh, business school. I've spoken with different affinity groups. And everywhere I go, Dan, uh, by and large, the conversation is how can we get more of a police presence? Uh, we have these safety concerns and we really want to collaborate with the police what can we do to assist? I've heard from parents uh, with several different uh, parent organizations that are really uh, concerned about their uh, young adult safety. So they want to be partners with us and we welcome, uh, we at UCPD welcome those partnerships and are really working with the community. But overall, we've been welcomed with open arms. So you talked about that interest in having more and about concern about crime. We're going to get into that and talk about the numbers in just a bit. Where do things stand in terms of the staffing level of UCPD? I know that the force is much smaller than it was 10, 15 years ago. But I think I also heard from you in an earlier conversation you and I had that you've got open positions that are hard to recruit. Where are you at in terms of staffing right now? Yes, so uh, I want to say that since I've been here, it's really been a, a supportive environment for UCPD to attain more staff. Uh, we've gotten uh, funding and assistance from our stakeholders. Uh, right now, we are at 42 sworn officers. 
But with that said, we also have another, um, several other components of UCPD that assist with safety and security. That includes our uh, special police officers who are not armed and our community service officers who are students that assist us with several safety initiatives. So while the sworn presence um, is small, we also have an extension of that with our um, non-sworn personnel. We have several uh, vacancies. Uh, we, I'm proud to say we are filling those vacancies, Dan, and we are filling them quickly. Uh, we uh, have one of the best retirement systems in the Bay Area. Uh, we are one of the most friendly and compassionate police departments. Um, I couldn't be more proud of the women and men that I serve with. So it's just a uh, healthy environment to, to work in. Uh, we care about the uh, officers' uh, mental health and wellness. We want to make sure that they are armed with the best tools and resources uh, to really complete this difficult uh, job on a daily basis. So yes, we are hiring. We have several officers uh, that are coming on board, but we do have more work to do. Um, got it. Be, I, I'm going to just a second jump into some of the really good questions we've received from folks in the audience. Uh, but before I do, for those of you who may have joined us late, we're talking today with Chief Yogananda Pittman, who took the reins of UCPD last February. We've got a number of great questions already submitted, but if you have questions as we go along, feel free to post them to our Facebook Live site. Probably won't get to all of them, but we'll do our best. Let me jump into some of the questions we've got. Here's one. Prospective students are often very concerned about safety and are keenly aware of the high crime rate in the Bay Area. They're worried that it's not safe living and going to school here, meaning in Berkeley. What would you say to them about their concerns? I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge uh, the crime rates uh, in the Bay Area uh, in the surrounding community. I think we have to acknowledge that. Um, we, we keep um, statistical data uh, and keep a close eye on that so we can have deliberate responses to mitigate those crimes. I would say, uh, Dan, in general terms, crime is on the rise in every major city across America. It's uh, a concern that uh, not only the police have, but the communities have. Uh, crime has to be addressed as a collaboration between law enforcement and the community, and our students are a part of that community. What I would also say to them is there are a number of things that we can do to work together to address those crime concerns. Things like being aware of your surroundings. Uh, so many of our young adults, uh, myself included, uh, not necessarily as a young adult, but uh, we use technology on a daily basis. Uh, we're connected uh, to our iPhones or Android phones, and we could be walking with the phones in hand, headphones or earbuds in our ears looking down. We want to make sure that we are paying attention to our surroundings. Uh, when I address the uh, student organizations and groups, I tell them to make sure when they're going out, that they're able to travel in groups. There is safety and numbers. We want to ensure that they're doing that. Uh, there are a number of safety apps that they can download to their phones to include our timely warnings and warn me initiative. So if there's a vulnerable area around the campus, we want them to get that uh, messaging almost in real time so that they can avoid those areas and continue to be safe. They can get updates about what's going on in and you know, around the campus. Uh, lastly, I will say that, uh, Dan, we can't investigate crimes unless we know something about it. 
Uh, sometimes there's been a culture of uh, drawing the line between the community and police departments where sometimes the community is hesitant about reporting crime. Uh, they don't want to be appear to be as a snitch or some people just have a general fear of law enforcement. And I understand that. But I do also want to offer avenues that are um, displayed on our website. You can report things anonymously. You don't have to come into the uh, police station or headquarters. You don't have to stop an officer on the street. But if you see something, we really do want you to say something because we can not investigate what we don't know about. If we know about it, we can put the, um, uh, patrols in specific areas that we know uh, that are high targets. For example, we had our students uh, have move-in day uh, very recently. So we definitely beefed up security. We blocked off streets and entrances so that students could move into buildings in the safest manner uh, possible. So while crime is on the rise, there are a number of things that UCPD is doing to make deliberate efforts to mitigate those crimes. And just to make sure that we all understand, so you talked about collaboration at the very beginning. Is that what you mean, meaning taking step, you know, strength in numbers, see something, say something? Is that what you mean by collaboration with the community? Well, I would even extend it a little further than that. Hmm. I think that collaboration means that student organizations, uh, we need to work together with law enforcement. I think that the unhoused uh, crisis that we're dealing with in the Bay Area, that we're, we make sure that we're working with co community leaders uh, to address that population and offer resources other than just a police response. Uh, sometimes people have challenges in the community that uh, are not crimes, quite frankly, and they don't solicit or warrant a law enforcement response. However, it is a concern of the community. So I think that the administrators, the respective uh, departments, the cabinet, the council of deans, we all have to uh, collaborate and work together to come up with a holistic response for the entire community. So would I be wrong to understand from what you said that you support this notion of taking a careful look at what responsibilities we assign to law enforcement and what responsibilities might be handled better, for example, by mental health professionals? That, you know, that re-examination of exactly what we ask of our law enforcement officers. is Do I have that right? Uh, you're absolutely right, Dan. Um, we are working with the president's office on a number of initiatives that require us in the University of California school system to have a tiered response. And it's exactly what you just said. Uh, when there are uh, concerns, for example, with the unhoused, they may not be uh, committing a crime but they could be in areas where they're not authorized to be in. Uh, that doesn't necessarily warrant a law enforcement uh, response. So we have other uh, community members that can respond to them and offer them uh, resources so that they're not traversing in areas of the campus where we want academic instruction to go on, for example. You know, it's really interesting. Um... We have three separate questions that all seem to be focused on a perception and perhaps a reality that there are more members of the public frequenting campus buildings. They may or may not be unhoused. And I, I wanna go through each of these questions because the fact that we get three questions suggests that it's a pretty significant concern for members of the campus community. So the first one is that so asks, what what is what are the campus plans for dealing with unhoused members of the community that reside in off-campus buildings leased by the university, but occupied by members of the university community? So this is about off-campus buildings. Is there any plan to deal with that, or is that something you're still looking into? 
Yes, we do have plans uh, and we actually respond to off campus housing, uh, for example, down at Albany Village. Uh, approximately three weeks ago, I, um, along with members of RSSP, uh, Ms. Jo Magnus and her team uh, went down to Albany Village to offer a community safety briefing. And uh, we are working with the uh, towns that surround those communities. I work with law enforcement chiefs in those areas, as well as community advisors to make sure we're offering uh, the unhoused populations uh, resources in those areas. Dan, we have so much work to do though. Um, the state of California really um, regulates how we respond. We have to offer housing and resources to anyone who's been in a specific area more than 48 hours. And we really want to be respectful of that and show uh, compassion to the unhoused. But we also have a responsibility at the same time to offer those students that are in um, off-campus housing, uh, not only uh, safety tips and practices, but they need to feel safe. Uh, sometimes they're young children uh, traversing those areas. We want to make sure that we're offering them resources, uh, whether it's infrastructure in terms of fencing or gated communities. We have a special police officer, a lot of times that's assigned uh, to those um, communities so that uh, members of the community know how to go to the special police officer and uh, make them aware of their concerns. And UCPD also dispatches uh, officers for a law enforcement response to those areas as well. Um, before I go on, there's two other related questions, but it, for people who want additional information, where should they go? UCPD website, best, best source around? Yes, and thank you so much for asking. I've been working with our campus partners uh, Ms. Ellen Top has uh, diligently been working on a website. So if anybody goes to uh, berkeley.edu and puts in safety, you will see a website uh, that's been recently updated and it has all sorts of information, anything and everything that's related to safety. Uh, some of the uh, services we offer in terms of our night shuttles, in terms of the community service officers uh, offering bear walk where they essentially will escort members of the community to their cars, as, um, to their vehicles, to their homes, wherever they're going. And it tells you how to initiate those services. So yes, they can visit us on the UCPD website. Got it, thank you. Um, another campus safety question. What concrete, and this is slightly different than the last one, maybe even more than slightly. What concrete measures um, can staff take to protect themselves, students, and visitors from threats caused by members of the public who access our buildings but are not affiliated with the campus? Um, what sort of training is available for staff? Should we be utilizing security cameras and or alarms? Our staff are scared what can we do to create a safer environment? Yes, so right now uh, the campus has what we call the active threat preparedness team. And there's a, a small core group of us. And then there's a subgroup of individuals that um, their primary focus is to address concerns just like you stated. We first and foremost want to know and want uh, the campus uh, staff to report to us when they have these types of concerns. Dan, I can't tell you the number of times since I've been here that I have received calls from uh, employees and staff that have reported that they have um, unhoused or non-affiliates with the campus in their areas and it has caused significant levels of concern. Our response to them, um, and an immediate response is always to dispatch officers 
or special police. But in addition to that, we also have worked with our IT friends to look at our uh, robust cam uh, camera system to make sure if there are not cameras in the area, uh, we address how much it would cost to put them there, who's gonna monitor them. I've worked really closely with all of those departments to really want to have a holistic approach. Uh, in addition to that, one more thing I'd like to mention is we have reassigned uh, staff to okay. specific garages, particularly during peak hours to address non-affiliates to make sure that our employees can traverse to and from work uh, free from uh, crime or just the feeling overall of being unsafe. I've also worked with the residential aides or residential assistants to train and educate them on what to do if there's someone in a dorm uh, that doesn't belong, uh, things that we don't want them to do, uh, if a person is acting erratically or aggressive in nature, when they need to call UCPD to have us come out uh, to assist and to avoid things like tailgating. We don't want our community members holding the doors open. Um, many of our members of the, the community really have a compassionate heart and they really want to help, uh, particularly the unhoused, but we want them to, to really assist and help them in a manner that is safe for the entire uh, community. So we go out and we give briefings on those types of things uh, all the time, Dan. So when you say tailgating, just to be clear, we're not talking about parties before the football game. We're talking about what that habit of leaving a door open for somebody you may not know. That That's exactly it. We don't want them to uh, hold the door open or prop a door open for someone they don't know because they are trying to seek shelter uh, at that particular time. But I want to circle back on something we got started on this last part of the discussion with the question about what can staff do? And I think you gave a really excellent broad picture. If there's a staff group out there in a particular building or, you know, in advance of a particular event that like to know more, is there a particular person they should reach out to at UCPD? Should they start with the website? Um, what would be your advice to somebody who says, boy, that sounds interesting. I, I, I want to know more. What should they do? They can always reach uh, myself and as well as my colleagues at the UCPD website. We have a general mailbox there for the office of the chief that's checked uh, regularly by my staff. They can always give us a call at 510-642-6760. And I did just have to learn that number. Uh, <laughs> being on the Hill for 20 plus years, knowing all the numbers. Uh, that's new for me, but uh, in all seriousness, they can always reach out by phone as well. Uh, we have staff here uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We are always open and always prepared to respond to their concerns. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and in just a second after this next question, I have another email address. I think the general mailbox for, for your particular office, but let's go back to another question that somebody sent in and it goes as follows. Is UCPD allowed to ask anyone who looks suspicious what their business is on campus and ask anyone who does not have legitimate business to leave? Or is that considered profiling? So the, the short answer is yes. Uh, UCPD can engage with any member of the community uh, that they, um, they could have a reasonable suspicion uh, that they could articulate as why they're communicating with a person. But I think even more importantly, uh, it's important for UCPD to engage with members of the community at all times, not just when something is uh, going wrong. Uh, we want to be out and about in the community we want to uh, have an opportunity to really uh, expand our relationships with community members. So we don't want to only engage 
because we think there's nefarious activity, we really want a uh, community to see us as protectors, as servants uh, to them. Uh, profiling is when you're doing things that are inappropriate. You're being biased against a particular person or persons because of the way they look, because of the way they dress, or you're doing something uh, that's against a person's uh, civil rights. We will have zero tolerance. And let me repeat that. I have zero tolerance for that. And if anyone would to ever experience that, I would want them to reach out to me directly so I could address it immediately. Got it. Thanks. Before we go on, I want to provide everybody with another email address for those of you who may want to reach out. Um, it's for the chief's office, and she gave me permission to share this email address. And it is chief, C-H-I-E-F dot of O-F dot police at berkeley.edu. That's chief.of.police at berkeley.edu. Gonna move on to another question that came in. Um, looking at UC Berkeley safety projects, can Chief Pittman speak to the status of the Everbridge warning notification upgrades and active threat preparedness projects? That feels like it's a little bit in the weeds, but it also feels like it's an important question. So if you could explain to us what that is and where things stand. Absolutely. So the active threat preparedness team, we meet bi-weekly. Uh, we have a team leader and we're working on a number of initiatives that uh, relate to safety. Uh, one of the things we've uh, done over the past month is uh, held a series of interviews for the Office of Emergency Management. Uh, that director position has been open. Uh, we also meet to discuss active threat preparedness in terms of if the campus experienced an active shooter, uh, what have we taught our community members, how we would respond, what is the response uh, of UCPD. So in May, I believe it was May of this year, uh, UCPD held a two-day training uh, that was all active shooter preparedness and response. We invited members of the community to come over uh, to the campus where we were hosting the training. So there was plenty of professional staff on hand to see what an officer uh, actually goes through when they're responding to a threat of an active shooter. Uh, we are in the process of preparing uh, the Department of Homeland Security's uh, run, hide, fight uh, training to the staff and employees here on the campus. Uh, we don't have a hard date as of yet right now, Dan, but we are working. And I think that we are very close uh, to coming to a consensus on the best way uh, to roll that project out. And I know you asked me some more questions within that, but I've lost uh, the second half of that. So if you could repeat it, that would help Yeah, me so that was the status of the Everbridge warning notification upgrades. Yes, so Everbridge is a notification system here that we use to send out messaging to the community anytime there could be a crisis or some type of threat to the campus. And not just, when I say threat, I don't just mean like active shooter. There could be a natural disaster mm. and or a power outage that's affecting the community. And we want them to be aware uh, if there's an evacuation site or rally point, uh, we would uh, give out information. In terms of the upgrades to the system, I know that it is a work in progress. I don't have all of the details, Dan, down in the weeds of exactly uh, when certain parts of that system will be brought online um, that we can share with the community. It's been upgraded uh, holistically, but I do know that it's a work in progress. There are biweekly meetings uh, to discuss Everbridge uh, as well. And so those are a number of things that we're working on to make sure that we can make this campus a lot safer. 
this this I have to say just this interview so so far just speaking with you and you've been here only since February it reminds me that being at Berkeley is like drinking from the fire hose it's sort of amazing <laughs> that you've gotten your it, arms it around really it. Yes, Dan, it really feels that way. Um, by me coming from a federal law enforcement agency uh, to a campus environment, there, there are lots of uh, obstacles and hurdles and things that I had to learn. Uh, one of those major ones is Cleary, uh, Cleary stats and, and data and how we share that with the campus. Uh, systems like Everbridge and uh, what are my responsibilities? What is the police department's responsibilities? And that is, has been a learning experience. And I honestly can say I am learning uh, each and every day. Uh, sometimes it's a little overwhelming, but I, it's a process that I also enjoy as well. So a question just came in that I don't quite understand, but I'm thinking you might. Um, okay. And so, so it's a follow up about Everbridge and the active, um, the active threat preparedness. And the questioner seems to believe that they're that they're at risk, um, that that the current status of those projects is that they are at risk. Is, is that the case? And what does that mean? And what can you what other information can you provide? And and why is this important? Yes, yeah, so we've developed uh, a, th a threat matrix, so to speak, to say where we are with each of these um, initiatives. So, for example, the Office of Emergency Management, I, I mentioned previously that we conducted a series of interviews uh, to get that position filled. We would consider that at risk until the position is actually wow. filled. Uh, for example, another one of our projects um, is the Police Accountability Board. Uh, that's an initiative that came from the president's office that we would collaborate with the community. And if there's a complaint against the police department uh, in a city, it would probably be called an independent advisory board where you have members of the community that are going to investigate and look at complaints. Well, that uh, initiative is on track. Hmm. We are right where we want to be. We're uh, moving into the training phase and are ready uh, pretty soon to launch those programs. So for the ones that are at risk, uh, they haven't, um, I won't say they haven't been started, but there's still a, a timetable that could be a little further away than we'd like it to be. But that does not mean uh, by any stretch of the imagination, Dan, that we aren't working on it and it's not on our radar. So this, um, the next question may be a dumb question on my part, but somebody once told me there are no dumb questions. I'm not sure about no that. No dumb questions. Um, yes. <laughs> So you mentioned the Office of Emergency Emergency Services and that you're looking to fill a position. Does that mean that office is going to be revitalized, reestablished back online? Because that was one of the questions we got. So, yes. And I would say that the office has been online. It's had an interim director. But you do want dedicated uh, staff in that position. Uh, particularly someone that has subject matter expertise in dealing with uh, natural disasters, uh, crisis management, and uh, it would be helpful if they have university experience while it's not necessary. Uh, I'm excited to say that um, the uh, stakeholders have narrowed it down to a few uh, all well-qualified candidates and I'm confident that relatively soon, over the next month or so, we will have someone to fill that position. And I am personally looking forward to partnering uh, with them because the, their responsibility for a campus this size is going to be enormous. And so I wanna make sure that um, we do everything we can to support them. Uh, we really have to work together emergency management and UCPD will go hand in hand 
on how this campus responds to any uh, natural disaster or crisis or any active threat to the campus. So in the uh, same general subject area, another another good question that's come in. Uh, and they ask, can you speak to the logic behind when the warn me notifications go out? This person says this week there was somebody with a pickaxe threatening a couple of students, but the warn me didn't go out until at least two hours later. Had the warn me gone out as it happened, maybe other students could have helped to find or catch the perpetrator. Um, how does the warn me system work? And this, and can you use this particular incident as an example? Yes. Yeah, so uh, the warn me system works. It's uh, regulated by the Department of Education. It requires uh, campuses and universities across the nation to report in a timely fashion any threat to the campus community within a specific jurisdiction. And so if it falls within certain parameters uh, on or um, immediately adjacent to the campus community, uh, that information is processed typically by a sergeant within UCPD. Uh, we work with the Cleary team to make sure that we're getting out those messages in a timely fashion. Um, while I can't speak specifically to the timeline um, that the messaging went out for the individual with a pickaxe, I will say that by and large, uh, UCPD does a phenomenal job at making sure that we're getting out information as quickly as possible. If there are concerns uh, about the timeline, I am more than willing to discuss whatever measures that we can put in place. I think there's always room uh, for improvement. And so I would want to collaborate with the community on how we can get messaging out uh, quickly. Uh, Dan, uh, one of the challenges is sometimes we also hear from members of the community that uh, feel like the warning messages are triggers for them and they don't want to, to hear or see them um, in what we would call a timely fashion. So there's a delicate balance there. I think that we have a responsibility and a legal obligation um, to the uh, Department of Education that we follow and adhere to those guidelines, but we also want to do the right thing for the right reason. And what I mean by that is sometimes there are things happening around the campus that may not fit the criteria or parameters uh, to warrant a warn me message. However, those that are affected by whatever incident and is happening and in there in that immediate area, they would still want some type of messaging. So we're working with our partners to see where that fine line is how we can communicate by not necessarily mass messaging to 80,000 members of the community, but if it's an incident that's specific to, for example, California Hall, how can we do some targeted messaging so that folks in and around that area uh, would be aware of what's going on and we can properly mitigate those things. So we've got more work to do uh, in those uh, with Warn Me. You know, all that you just discussed in that answer brings to mind another question, which is, I mean, you've been in the business long enough that I, when you started, there wasn't such a thing as social media. But now very <laughs> often when something happens on campus, um, social media lights up and sometimes has accurate information before the campus does. Sometimes it's spreading inaccurate information. Sometimes it's hard to know what the heck it's doing. How do you think about that? How do you take that into account that there are all these independent sources of information exploding simultaneously every time there's an incident? It's, it's a fine balance. I uh, am a fan of social media. I have, as we mentioned earlier, two, two young people <laughs> Uh, that are um, hooked, you know, their phones are uh, like glued to their hands. <laughs> and they get a lot of their information uh, via various social media platforms. 
I think for uh, law enforcement and those in the safety community, we can leverage uh, social media to communicate with our uh, community, uh, particularly students. It's a viable way to get them accurate information. Uh, UCPD uh, posts things regularly on Twitter, uh, Instagram, and Facebook. So uh, that's one resource that they will have uh, to receive accurate updates from the police department, as well as our campus partners when things are going on in and around the community. So we have to, to leverage it responsibly. Uh, we also have to be uh, mindful that at times um, the community may be posting things that are sensitive in nature. Mm. And so we always try to be respectful of uh, individual family members, uh, friends that may not have received mm. uh, some sensitive information. So I always try to get that word out as well that, that we don't want to, to share information before it's time. A lot of times we have to make notification uh, to family members um, before we send out any mass messaging. Yep. Speaking of students, another question just came in. Are there any personal safety classes for students or is that just sort of written in online resources for them? There aren't uh, any personal uh, safety classes that UCPD sponsors. However, there is a tremendous amount of uh, online safety classes that um, there's uh, members of the community like the um, National Intelligence Resource Center, uh, the Nick Rick in San Francisco. There are other local uh, municipalities that offer online courses as well about best practices as regarding safety. And I would encourage the community to reach out. Many of these online trainings are free of charge. Uh, all you have to do is register and sign up. And so there's a lot of information about best safety practices out there uh, that students and faculty have uh, access to. Do you think that, speaking of student safety, Based on what you know now, do you think the concerns that parents have, that students have, that staff and faculty have, do you think they're out of proportion with what the data say about the actual degree of risk in and around campus? Or is it or are the concerns understandable from where you sit? Are they anchored in the reality of the situation for this university in this urban environment? I think that a person's uh, perception is their reality. Mm. I think that uh, as a law enforcement professional, we provide safety measures and tips and techniques. Uh, we know what the best practices are, but I think there's a big difference between being safe and feeling safe. And if you don't feel safe, no matter what the, the numbers say, no matter what the subject matter experts say, that's just a feeling that's inside of you that we're going to have to work together uh, to change that feeling, uh, to change that perception. And I think all of the things here that we've had an opportunity to discuss this afternoon, Dan, are ways that we can get folks to really that feeling of being safe. I think that at times um, data has to be put into context. Uh, I work closely with Abby, who's our uh, Cleary representative, and the, the numbers are quite frankly concerning. They're very concerning. And the numbers do appear to be on the rise. Uh, with that said, we've got to really uh, adhere to what our best safety practices are and really reach out to the community um, I have in my mind as a law enforcement professional, what I believe um, is valuable to the community in terms of safety, but it's really important for us to, to have a listening ear to the community 
because just because I've been in the profession doesn't mean that I can't learn or we all can't learn. And we want to hear from them about what's important to them. And then we tweak our response and tailor our responses to make sure that we're adhering to the needs of the community and not just what we think may be best. Got it. Um, I'm going to turn the next question into a request. Uh, somebody was looking for an org chart at UCPD. The last one they found is from 2015. Um, so the request here is that the org chart could be updated on the UCPD website. We will take care of that immediately. There you go. Was not here in 2015, so I know <laughs> my name is not on the org chart, and uh, we definitely want to be representative of the folks that are here in place uh, today. Thank you. Um, let's go to something that uh, there were a few questions that suggested to me that people may not everybody may completely understand the jurisdictional differences and areas between Berkeley Police Department, UCPD. We had a question about why the city of Berkeley doesn't enforce traffic violations. We had a question about why there's mass double parking on the 2500 block of Durant Avenue. Um, we had a question about why Berkeley doesn't have more of the parking uh, enforcement staff be assigned to law, you know, to crime. So if you could answer those, I, I think I know what the sort of the general answer is, but let me let me defer to you and help those people who may still be confused about who does what in town. It, it's, it's so understandable, Dan. Uh, we work so closely together. Uh, UCPD, a, a lot of times it's just the south side or north side of a sidewalk that uh, delineates where UCPD's jurisdiction ends and Berkeley Police Department's uh, jurisdiction starts. But uh, we work very closely together. You will see uh, Berkeley police officers in and about the community, uh, whether it's on Telegraph Avenue, uh, in and around the people's construction site, uh, just in general speaking, all around the campus. However, sometimes when um, community members call for a police response, if it's in Berkeley Police Department's jurisdiction, the dispatchers are well aware of those uh, lines and they will dispatch a Berkeley City police officer. If it's something that uh, UCPD needs to have situational awareness of, we communicate really well. Um, and vice versa, if it's UCPD responding to something that we know could spill over or affect uh, the surrounding communities, we make sure that we partner with them. Our PIOs often do uh, public uh, service announcements jointly. Um, I speak regularly with the community representatives of the city of Berkeley to make sure that if they have initiatives that are going to directly impact the campus, that I'm sharing that information with our stakeholders. But uh, I, I would close with uh, many times there's um, confusion, uh, particularly if there's something going wrong, so to speak, with who could be at fault. Uh, we, we are confused with Berkeley City Police and sometimes they are confused with us. What I can say to that is if you call our dispatch center, we are always going to get you to the right place and to the right people. If you ever have any questions, if the community has questions about who is responding to us, they can always reach out uh, to us at uh, UCPD and request to speak with a supervisor. Those persons are well-versed in who can and who is the most appropriate uh, person to respond uh, from a law enforcement and safety perspective to the surrounding community's needs. Thank you. Um, we are just about out of time, believe it or not. And while we've been talking, a number of additional excellent questions have come in. And we sort of anticipated this, Chief, before, uh, before we got on today. So we really want to encourage people who have questions that we didn't have a chance to get to, 
to use that mailbox we talked about before. That's chief, C-H-I-E-F dot of, O-F dot police at berkeley.edu. That email address, if you don't have a pen handy, is also on the UCPD website. Um, last question, and it's admittedly going to be a softball, but I'm curious all the same. Five years from now, where do you hope we are in terms of safety on the campus, in terms of the relationship between the department and the community, um, in terms of that feeling of safety that you've talked about? What's your What's your vision and aspiration five years down the road? My vision for UCPD five years from now is that culturally we would have done a 360. I see this as an opportunity to make a real and true impact on how law enforcement is viewed uh, in this campus community. I want the uh, campus to really uh, know that we are working hard every day uh, and really want to be acknowledged by our own actions as uh, this answering for this police department. I see those clearly stats and numbers coming down because we would have developed a strategic plan and a holistic approach to how we're going to address and mitigate crimes. And then I think that uh, five years from now, we're going to see a higher number of community stakeholders that have kind of um, a police board uh, presence that we're working together hand in hand with our professional and civilian staff. So it's not just a, a UCPD approach, it's the Berkeley approach. Chief Pittman, I want to thank you for your time. Thank you for coming to Berkeley. Thank you for your service to the country on January 6th, before and beyond that date. Um, I think we're going to have to have you back, judging not, not too long, judging by the number of questions. <laughs> thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And, and Chief, thanks again. Thanks again for your time. I appreciate it. All right. Have a good day.